Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I'm really happy to be with this academic, someone who, before I hit the record button, I was telling him that uh, I've known of his work from the Gothic universe and uh, from my love of uh, Dracula, especially. Uh, so we'll get into a little Gothic horror, see where we uh, bridge the gap between those two genres. Uh, but I want to introduce my guest to you all. Um, his name is Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock. And I want to say Andrew because that's our commonality together. We're two Andrews. Um, he is a professor of English at uh, Central Michigan University. Um, he teaches American literature, pop culture, which we'll get into what it's like teaching pop culture because I'm fascinated with that. Um, I was just saying to him that it's rare to see someone born in Washington, D.C., but you know, he was also raised in Maryland, uh, earned his BA in English from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so kind of a Philadelphian. I'll, I'll claim him uh, here. Uh, he has an MA in American Lit from George Washington University. Oh, the George Washington University. That's right. They get very specific there, um, like the Ohio State, uh, and has a uh, PhD from the Interdisciplinary Program in the Human Sciences at the George Washington University. And um, he's been at Central Michigan University since 2001. He works on cultural work performed by the Gothic. So how Gothic texts and practices give shape to culturally specific anxieties and desires. And he has a lot of texts that he's written. Um, we're only scratching the surface here, but I'm really excited to talk to you, Jeffrey, today about your Broadview Press text. So welcome to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, hopefully I didn't embarrass you too much with my uh, bio introduction. Okay. <laughs> um, but so right away, I'm really curious of like, where does this fascination with the Gothic, like since that is a genre you're so passionate about in your academic writing and, you know, academic slash um public scholarly writing. We can talk about that because I feel like you bridge these worlds with the public and the academic community in such a wonderful way, which is why I can't wait to talk to you. Um, so yeah, where does this just fascination, the Gothic, how did it enter Jeffrey's universe? Well, I'm, what I've done is I've taken a personal interest and turn it into a focus of academic scrutiny. Um, I was drawn to ghost stories in particular as a little boy um, and, and developed a, a real passion for supernatural tales, which is something that has always stayed with me. I branched out as I got older, but I've always had a kind of fascination with monsters and with ghosts and with the supernatural and spooky things in general. So I kind of naturally gravitated towards that as part of my academic pursuit. Yeah, so you're saying you turned your passion into a study. I love how you phrase that. I think it's what kind of now, I taught a Broadway musical course last year. That's a deep passion of mine. I trained in musical theater. Um, literature, of course, I'm sure is our passions. But to like talk, talk about genres, I mean, even when we were conversing about your work with pop culture, like you had a really interesting way of framing it to me. I'm not sure if you remember that email exchange, but like to me, pop culture is reality TV in my life, which I'm, everyone here knows I've interviewed some like real housewives personalities <laughs> and I am so into the minutia of the narratives of the housewives. Like I just love when they dissect one little problem for a whole season. Um, but you know, for you, was pop culture and the Gothic, like, does that go hand in hand for you as passions? I think so. Um, in as much as horror and the Gothic typically gets accommodated by that rubric of pop culture, those things have gone hand in hand. Things like uh, horror novels, Stephen King, uh, Clive Barker, films like Poltergeist when I was little or more recently, you know, the, the revamped versions of the It films, all of those things, I think, easily are accommodated under the category of popular culture. Yeah, well, I love and I'm obsessed with Stephen King. So, you know, Jeffrey asked me if I like enjoy the gothic. And the answer is I like the gothic, but I think 
I am more like in my everyday life. Um, of course, I love Edgar Allan Poe and the 19th century Gothic. Um, but I, oh, I like when it bridges the Gothic and is it Gothic or is it horror? Like psychological. I'm more of a psychological horror person. So Stephen King's Carrie, I've taught that. I actually have, actually when this comes out, our episode, I will have just released the Carrie the Musical Broadway episode because I know someone who was involved with the Carrie musical and talk about such an interesting ad adaptation. But yeah, so I love Stephen King. I'm obsessed. That's basically my Stephen King uh, pronouncement of love, my declaration of sorts. But yeah, so was it for you when you were growing up, was it more the a film based fascination a literature based or they all started to combine like was it the chicken or the egg basically? Um, they kind of went hand in hand i think i was more literature based early on with um, ghost stories edgar Allan poe and graduating then to lovecraft but at the same time um i enjoyed horror films I, some, some of my memories from childhood are very specific to uh, horror television or film. Um, I remember being completely entranced, as, and I must have been seven or eight, by uh, a made-for-TV Disney movie called Child of Glass, which I'm sure would be, uh, if I were to watch it again, I, I would probably think it was kind of funny, but at the time I was really gripped because there was this little ghostly Creole girl who enlisted the aid of a living boy to help her recover a lost cache of diamonds. Uh, otherwise she was like damned for eternity. Um, wow. And I was, it was, it seemed really dark for Disney, right? And I was just kind of like- Wait, when was this, Jeffrey? 78, 79? Oh yeah, Disney had that period of the 70s mm -hmm. to 80s where they really, I mean- do you know Return to Oz? I don't know Return to Oz. I'm oh, if you like something comes, that's, <laughs> yeah, if you like gothic Disney, it is really eccentric and gothic. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's um, takes on the more gothic narrative of L. Frank Baum. So there's like the queen, is she, I forget if she's a queen, but she, um, like takes over other princesses heads and like wears them and they show this in the film <laughs> it's a decapitation scene and mm -hmm. now that i look back i think wow this is really uh it's basically return to oz as dorothy is going through psychiatric treatment <laughs> is how it starts because they think that she's having these uh, delusions of grandeur sure. and she needs treatment and then she goes back to oz and the yellow brick road it has exploded and everything is in a dystopian universe so yeah definitely let me know but now i need to watch this one uh right, right. that and you I re recommend i remember I'm, i remember being completely fascinated by the haunted mansion at disney oh yeah um yeah. which was the ride that i wanted to go on multiple times um poltergeist which came out in 83 was something that remains like burned into my memory so <laughs> Uh, I think literature and film and television all kind of went hand in hand in the development of my interest in the Gothic. Well, and it seems like you're kind of offering a definition of pop culture of sorts just from these examples, which is what I love is, so to you, is pop culture just what you are as a person, anyone listening, what you are absorbed by, um, in your artistic life? Like it could be film, TV, magazines, uh, popular novels. So like, what to you is, what makes a pop culture compared to say a niche academic subject? Yeah, right, right, right. I mean, that's a question that in the textbook that I published on pop culture, pop culture for beginners, um, there's a whole section that's devoted to trying to figure, to figure out what this thing popular culture is, because it's often defined as not being these other things. It's not mm -hmm. folk culture. It's not elite culture. It's not uh, this, that, or the other thing. So I kind of run through all those definitions. And then towards the end, I try to offer like a more precise definition of what we can use for pop culture. Um, so there's a handful of characteristics that I use to identify something that's pop culture. Um, it's 
first activities and social practices and things that people can do, usually without significant training, education, or cost. So there's a low barrier to participation. Um, often associated with youth culture in particular, doesn't have to be, but typically, um, and uh, a tendency to be ephemeral. So it kind of comes and goes relatively quickly. Um, often are activities or practices that display a kind of irreverence toward established standards of quality or taste um, and, and people who seek to enforce those things. Uh, and um, they're interestingly often assumed to lack a kind of interpretive depth or complexity, which isn't a which is something I take issue with throughout the whole textbook. Um, so there are a bunch of characteristics that I associate with pop culture. Um, it's often something that is individualistic in the sense that someone pursues their personal tastes or desires or passions, but at the same time, it's communal in the sense that one is uh, pursuing that together with other like-minded individuals. Mm -hmm. So there's both an individualistic aspect and a communal aspect to it. So, Comic-Con is a great example, right? These oh, yeah. conventions. I mean, even Bravo has a convention. Um, so these communities, that's so interesting that there's Polk Classics, Rocky Horror Picture Show. I know you're a Rocky Horror Picture Show fan. I've read, you know, Jeffrey's examples. Um, but okay, so there's some communal shared interest. I really like that um, definition. And I think that the low cost is something I want to bring up because it does seem like pop culture threatens the academic establishment. Um, and again, I'm not trying to, I know there's a lot of academics who listen, so it's not personal, but um, that it threatens, say, having the shared knowledge of a very um, a paywall type subject, right? That you need access to a $100 journal for a subscription that, you know, a academic book is, you know, not Broadview Press, <laughs> not their books, which is why I love having them as a sponsor um, because everything is very affordable. Um, but like we know some academic books could be 200, $300. Um, and yeah, so that it is accessible. It's for the public's consumption, right? Um, so it, where is there, it seems like though there is more of a bridge with ac the way it can be taught in say universities, then maybe people um, had fought back years ago that there is kind of this new resurgence. Like, do you feel that in the university there's this appetite to teach pop culture within the theoretical discussions that you kind of need to with students. There has been an erosion of that chasm between uh, academic elite culture and pop culture. And I think it's for two reasons. Um, mm -hmm. The first, I do think there has been a somewhat grudging acceptance within the academy that pop culture texts can have social significance and complexity. Um, mm -hmm. And at the same time, however, universities are seeking to capitalize where they can on tuition dollars, and students often tend to gravitate towards courses that have a pop culture component. So there is an incentive on the part of the university to offer courses on, say, fantasy and science fiction or cult film or um, sports and literature. Uh, yes. They're popular with students on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think increasingly as cultural studies has made inroads into the university, um, there are fewer faculty members who are really resistant to the idea that pop culture has value. Yeah, well, and, you know, what I loved about when I taught, um, well, and I feel that something when I, um, I'll shout Ashley out. Ashley is like our Broadview Press marketing uh, uh, angel spirit. Um, She's a real person, but she's like a spirit with the people that she connects with me with because she knows my genre passions. And when I saw that there was this pop culture for beginners book that you worked on, Jeffrey, I was so excited because to just have it out there as a text that, you know, is affordable, is accessible for instructors is something where we now have a language, right? You kind of just 
show, sh- showed us the pillars, so to speak, of how you define pop culture. But when I took my students during spring break to see Wicked or Phantom of the Opera, to have that experiential, to me, the classroom should be experiential, no matter what you teach. It's no matter if I, when I taught 19th century um, queer American literature, or when, you know, you teach hope fiction or fantasy literature, whatever the subject is, that there's always embedding. Maybe it's that I'm teaching podcasts that relate to those topics, right? Like what we're doing right now is a form of pop culture, which is why I'm so, you know, in love with sharing this because it, there isn't a cost barrier. And um, it, it excites me that you see, and it excites me to know that you also um, think that there's more of this embracing now of pop culture methodology. Like, oh, teach Bridgerton in a Regency era course. Of course. Well, I'm repeating, of course, but you know, it makes sense. Why wouldn't you teach what has become a fanfare in the White Lotus even, right? If you're teaching a noir course, I would teach the White Lotus, um, you know, that you can have these quote unquote high lowbrow, even though like, I'm curious, is pop culture really lowbrow? It kind of seems that that's a misnomer. I take issue with the assertion that pop culture is lowbrow Mm -hmm. um, because it requires just as much background and cultural competency as it does to interpret high culture texts. The difference often is our familiarity with the genre. Um, Someone in order to interpret Victorian realist novels needs to have an introduction to Victorian culture and Victorian realist novels. Um, Whereas somebody who has grown up on a diet of television sitcoms and animated television has been steeped in it for many, many years and don't realize that they're engaged in a process of interpretation because it's so natural to them. It's something that you're familiar with. So you don't stop and think about the interpretive moves that you're making to it. Um, I make a comparison in the pop culture book between looking at a portrait and then looking at a cubist portrait. And the cubist portrait will often strike lots of viewers who don't know anything about cubism as, you know, what the heck is that? Um, And it's because you're not introduced to the genre, what the artists are trying to achieve, the various strategies that are being utilized. Once you know those things, you can look at it and you can interpret it and you don't stop. You only stop in your tracks when you're confronted with something that can't be accommodated by the strategies that you typically use. Mm. Um, So there's just as much cultural competency necessary to interpret pop culture texts as what were conventionally called high culture texts. It's just that certain bodies of knowledge have traditionally been regarded as having more or less value. Um, It's a question I raise, you know, you can know everything about Shakespeare and that marks you as an educated and cultured person. You can know every single thing about the Simpsons. And, and that marks you as being pop culture competent. But why is knowing everything about Shakespeare more valuable than knowing everything about The Simpsons? Um, yeah, it that should. One? Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, in most of our everyday lives, it's rare that I find someone who says I'm a, only a highbrow uh, consumer or I'm a lowbrow consumer, right? Aren't we always straddling? We're kind of, it's always a mix. Like whether... Even you're on the subway and you're reading one of those poems in action. That's a form of what you're, it's this in between. I mean, and I agree with you. I don't like the positioning of highbrow, lowbrow. I actually don't even like these terms because they are, um, it it doesn't reflect our everyday lives. Like our everyday lives is, hey, maybe I want to tune into um, the latest Bachelor or Survivor or The Amazing Race, and then you know what? I'm going to read Bolivar's Travels, right? It's, and these novels that we analyze, or Shakespeare is a great example, right? Shakespeare in its time was for supposed to be for the masses, for the groundlings. I mean, uh, <laughs> that they could stand and throw like uh, peanuts at each other. I mean, I'm not sure that's what they were doing, but um, that they were listening to what we would think is now eloquent like high culture language, but it was actually for them just a spectacle. And um, yeah, I I think it's so fascinating 
um, the way you're offering these definitions and examples that um, what for you, though, in the classroom, Jeffrey, like, have you had a chance to use your pop culture for beginners? Like, do you assign your own work is I guess the first I have question. Not had a, I, I use my composition book, the oh, Mad good. Scientist Guide to Composition. Um, I haven't had a chance to actually use my pop culture for beginners book yet because I haven't taught a course dedicated to pop culture since it came out. So the next time that I do, I would certainly use it. Uh, my university very generously makes me donate any royalties made off of my own students back to the university, all 15 or $20 worth. Um, but yeah, I would certainly use it if the, uh, if, if the opportunity came up. Oh, okay. Well, I think that... Um... Like what I'm thinking is when you do, um, when you're in the classroom and it doesn't just have to be that you taught, um, you know, that you assign the pop culture for beginners, but I'm sure it sounds like in your courses, you're always assigning say films, TV, music, um, uh, something to do with um, what's consumed by the public. Um, Right, consumed by the public. I kind of, I don't know. For me, maybe that's how I define pop culture. But um, that, what has surprised you maybe about with your teaching practice? What surprises you or what's a good example of a moment where you realized, oh, students are really, they're keyed in and they're, they need this type of teaching practice where I am, yeah. I mean, the surprise for me is always the extent to which students initially belittle their own pop culture interests as unimportant. Huh. Uh, they come in with the sense that there are academic topics which are important and there are academic topics which are fun. And they take the pop culture course because they wanna deal with something fun. Um, and the moment of surprise comes when they realize first that questions of value are always ideologically freighted. So based, you know, who, what criteria are we using to decide whether something is valuable or not and whose interests are served by those conclusions? Uh, but the real kind of turning point comes as we start to take apart these pop culture texts uh, and see how they work is, is the recognition that there is a kind of complexity to them. Um, that rather than being uh, straightforward and simplistic, there's an aspect of interpretation that's involved in them. And so they're actually engaged in a sophisticated process of making sense of their world. And then we move on from there. And the real moment comes when we start to talk about the ideological messages that are embedded within pop culture texts, the way in which they either reinforce or challenge conventional ways of thinking about the world. Um, and we look at you know, stories about the American dream maybe. And I ask, okay, whose interests are served uh, by the presumption that people are responsible for their own success and that anybody can go from rags to riches. Um, what would happen if everybody stopped believing in class mobility that they were and started to think they were trapped in the position they've been born into? Um, yeah. And they think, well, people would get uh, upset. Um, people would become frustrated if they realized that there were institutional obstacles to their progress that they couldn't overcome. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the seeds of revolution. So it's in the best interest of a capitalist economy to make people think they are responsible for their own advancement. And that if they just apply themselves, they can succeed. Um, and you know, you have these moments when you're talking about these narratives that are pervasive in American culture where the recognition and realization sets in. Um, and then you have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Like the American dream kind of theme. And there's so much... I've, I've touched upon that when I taught The Great Gatsby. Oh, also, shout out to Michael N uh, Nallen, who uh, I interviewed on the podcast. He did the new edition of The Great Gatsby for Broadview yes. Press. Um, but right, The Great Gatsby offers so many film adaptations. And I heard they're going to be making it into a Broadway musical soon, which I'm actually happy about because I said The Great Gatsby is ripe for a Broadway musical. Um, yeah, it's but a Baz Luhrmann piece if there yeah, ever was one yeah. exactly like there's gonna be i think it's gonna be a really explosive uh music well <laughs> the car accident definitely provides an explosion of sorts <laughs> um but uh, uh i think it could be really cool with the 20s um but right see there 
even like our discussions, I feel I'm in kinship with you because we're both coming from our own, um, our own consumption, our own understanding of what we are drawn to and then providing a type of critical lens to it. So that's what's, I, you're right though. Like when I first entered my PhD program in 2014, I kind of remember joking about the phenomenon of 50 shades of gray because it kind of had then just the films were coming out, I think. Um, and I said, wow, wouldn't it be interesting if someone taught 50 shades of gray to see why there's such this erotic mass consumership like who's the readership why um you know are mostly middle-aged women being drawn to these books um there's something there and i do remember some academics kind of laughed it off like well that language isn't interesting like who would want to read those texts they're not um they're not something of note you know they're not your jane austen or they don't have this classic emblem um I mean, even some would probably be surprised that, um, you know, Stephen King is taught, which I think has always been shocking to me because he's the most famous horror writer of the 20th to 21st century. But yeah, you're right, though. The tide has changed because now I really don't hear that, um, the questioning as much. And like for you, you said it's almost an old guard, a changing over of the guard. Or responding to the student's culture, which, yeah, I'm not sure how much we could separate that. But um, I I also think, I don't know if you see it in your classroom, Jeffrey, but especially because you're teaching, it seems like a lot of Gothic literature, fantasy literature, that students, though, attention to reading, they are reading, but it's in different forms that I would not be as comfortable to assign say an 800 page Victorian novel and be like, okay, this is what we're doing for two weeks um, is not how I would approach that practice. I mean, I'm not sure how you fall on that in terms of, you know, what students are reading right now. Right. Um, I teach a course called Monsters and Their Meanings, which is, is my baby. Like it was the course that I invented and the approach that I've settled on for that class is we do clusters where we have the classic version of a recognizable monster, say Dracula. We do an updated representation of the same monster. And then we have one or two films as part of the cluster. Uh, and the idea is to look at the way that the same monster signifies, resonates differently in different contexts. Um, I have to be somewhat careful with that class uh, the challenge for them are the Victorian Gothic novels. So the last time I did it, we do Dracula, we did Frankenstein, we did The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mm -hmm. um, particularly with my student population, if it's more than 300 pages, we start to run into trouble. <laughs> uh, so I do have to bear in mind length when it comes to assigning works. I find the same thing with fantasy and science fiction. Um, that length does become a little bit of a stumbling block if it's something that's excessive. Uh, sometimes it's a problem with Stephen King. Stephen King reads really well, but some of those novels are incredibly long. And I, I do it, like to- It is the Stephen one. King. Yeah, I can't, yeah. I couldn't do it as part of a course. Um, yeah, but I Carrie think, worked really well when I taught right. that novel. Yeah. yeah, so Carrie works particularly well. Um, I, I, I did do a course that was Stephen King uh, film and literature. So we like read the stories and some of the novels and then watched the adaptation as a film. I love that type of course. Um, that's and that's, wonderful. That was fun. And the real surprise for students in that course is that the best Stephen King films have typically been the ones that no one associates with Stephen King. So The Shawshank Redemption, Stand By Me, and The mm. Green Mile, mm -hmm. um, all of which are Stephen King. Um, that he's got treatments of King's works have gotten better. Um, but apart from Kubrick's The Shining, there have been a lot of lackluster earlier King adaptations. Carrie is quite good. Yes. Well, yeah, I'm yeah. as you as you could tell, I'm obsessed with Carrie. Well, also, I think it works for students because of the what I was seeing is how resonant the bullying theme and coming right out of high school. It does have this immediate connection. But I remember being taught Pet Cemetery, I did. I when I first entered college, I had a um, 
gothic and horror literature course. It was one of my favorites. Um, I always loved watching horror films during the Halloween season, but I will always watch horror. Like I will be that person who goes to this movie theater and I'll even go by myself and see the new scream because I just love, or I just saw the um, new Halloween. I really liked what they did with that one. Um, but yeah, there's always something, right? When you recognize, okay, this is my passion and I want to provide provide what I'm so enamored with to my students and show them that there is a way to a apply a critical approach really translates. I mean, doesn't it, Jeffrey? Because they're seeing how enthusiastic you are and you're not just trying to get through, say, I need to teach you all of these texts because they are, quote unquote, important. I mean, I love Victorian novels. And I think there's a way to teach the Victorian novel. Like there's a way to teach George Eliot's Middle March that responds to pop culture. Like I would break it up. Like if I was teaching that, I would teach Middle March throughout the whole semester by making it a thematic course where, okay, how does this one marriage plot relate to say something we're seeing in a Bridget Bridgerton episode, right? Like that, but that's just how I've been taught how to teach with my own mentors is this discussion base, this responding to what the students are being drawn to. Um, so yeah, you're speaking my language. And I think that so many, <laughs> so many instructors now have this model. So they're probably all nodding enthusiastically wherever they are listening to this. Um, but I will ask, do you ever find, um, not resistance, Do you? because that's not the term, but do you ever find, because um, I thought about this, especially because I teach queer topics, I teach like sex and literature ideas. Do you ever find that there's a tightrope to walk or you're worried about, well, especially when we're teaching uh, material that is for the public, there can be really steamy or juicy or, you know, sensual conversations because, um, the public's appetite for sex is, uh, you know, there. Um, do you think, do you ever think about, okay, am I um, um, breaking a barrier with teaching this material? Like even with Dracula's, um, you know, the Coppola film, because I love that version, um, even though it's so campy, but that's what draws me to it. It's highly sensual, but it's also, right, based on the novel. So yeah, how do you maybe straddle this? Am I going over overboard or not? Well, the weird thing is I have sometimes thought that I might get more pushback than I do. Mm -hmm. um, I have in various contexts brought up critical race theory, expecting to get an email, somebody hot under the collar, which hasn't happened yet. <laughs> it doesn't mean it couldn't happen in the future. Um, some of the novels that I teach, even Interview with the Vampire, which was one that I did not oh, yeah. too long ago, has a, a very pronounced homoerotic element to it, which we mm -hmm. were able to talk about within the classroom and nobody really found it particularly shocking. Um, so I, I did a section of composition this semester that was all about conspiracy theories. Um, and oh, we wow. talked about, you know, kind of anti-vaxxer conspiracies and the big lie involving the election. Um, and knock on wood, the students have stayed with me almost all, like, as far as I can tell, they're with me. Um, and I haven't had real pushback. I'm, I'm teaching a course next semester that has a, a theme of skin. And I'm still working out quite how I want to address it. Um, that's... The only time I, I, I'm sort of playing with it, it's hard to talk about skin, obviously, without skin shows, without eroticism, without sex. And it, and I don't know how I can do it quite without pornography as at least a point of reference. Mm -hmm. um, how mm -hmm. far in that direction I can go, I'm not sure yet. Yeah. Um, it's not well, Linda Williams has a lot to say about porn studies and academia. I mean, right, we have a whole category of it. But I look to those scholars, especially yeah. in our current moment. And I, well, not even current moment. I mean, I think she wrote that. What is it? Um, I have it on my shelf. But 
Linda Williams wrote her like groundbreaking porn studies mm -hmm. book of, oh, you can provide a scholarly analysis to porn, which is the number one searched Google search and was like, I think one of, um, is up there with uh, material that, um, uh, what is it that, um, like the Bible is the number one bestseller, but like near it is pornographic materials that it's always sold. Um, so I think it's so interesting though, that once she came out with that work, then the Academy recognized, oh, this can be, um, a topic of scholarly inquiry, but it, I think that's exactly though, what your pop culture for beginners is all about is once someone, um, with academic knowledge or someone who has a PhD and they devote a study to it, then it is seen as worthy, right? Like if someone came out with, and I'm, I know this exists, but I'm a, um, I've had discussions here with, um, uh, media, sex and media um, uh, experts and someone who is actually a, is a journalist and she was in Playboy about journalists and like looking into inquiries around Playboy and Playgirl. Jeffrey's like, how did we get here, Andrew? No, but <laughs> bear with me. Um, but that it does tell us a lot about culture, right? And trends and, you know, how photographs reflect the current moment. And, um, right. I mean, we don't really have print issues and popularity now. Um, everything has become digitized in a way, but you're right. That's an interesting question you're posing of how you're going to teach that of course built around skin. I mean, I don't even know, even with how open I am with teaching sex and media and those conversations, I don't know if I would teach, you know, a porn film. I actually probably, I'm still like, Oh, uh, I don't, because I think you'd have to have a, you'd have to have a faculty and an administration that, an administration, not the faculty, but that backs you on that. Like the students are all, they know what they're getting and sign off on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You're right that porn studies is now a legitimate area of academic inquiry. I think it's also very, very siloed. Um, that mm -hmm. is anyone who's taking a course knows what they're getting because they have signed up for it. If you're taking a course that's on pornography, um, you know in advance. I think it's one of the last barriers outside of that, I think. It becomes much more difficult, I think, to discuss in a general class um, where students might not have signed up with the anticipation that that was going to be part of it. So I, I'm, I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to go about that yet. <laughs> Well, when this episode comes out, you will have figured it out. So let me know. Yeah. Update update me, Jeffrey. I'm curious. But sure. well, and um, there's been, yes, of course, there's courses that, especially in art history courses, I mean, you can't go around the nude body. That is art history. Um, but you're right. When it's like a designated course and everyone knows, okay, I'm signing up for the nude in Western culture. We kind of know what we're getting, but I, I I think that's exactly right. Like when you're integrating that material into more of a general course, like composition or into like a survey course. Yeah, I you're right. I don't think we're at that. We're not at that point of where that's integrated and it won't be. I mean, pushback in the classroom is expected. Like I, I'm sure like me, you enjoy the academic, the scholarly debates in the classroom. To me, that's what college is for, is for those open conversations. But like, will you be backed? Will you be supported? Like, okay, I can teach this material and I'll be supported if a student pushes back to the highest level. I'm not sure. And anyone out there, I'm sure maybe you have a story. Uh, you know, you can DM the Ivory Tower Boiler Room on Instagram and I'll, uh, I mean, we also have a TikTok too, Jeffrey. So talk about trends in pop culture. Uh, TikTok has opened my eyes to teaching opportunities um, that I think is still not really tapped into by academics. Um, there's a lot going on there um, with disseminating knowledge. Well, and actually that is a good transition into your other work with Broadview, which, um, is how you have taught composition. I love what you've done with the Mad Scientist Guide to Composition. Um, that's Jeffrey's book. And it is so cheeky. It's 
playful. It's satirical. You're addressing the reader personally with your first person view, which ultimately is when I teach Whitman is what's so groundbreaking about Whitman's free verse. It's the poet has the speaker address the reader. Like, hey, reader, like reader out there just questioning. And you do that with this composition book. And I loved it because it is immediately developing a bond with the reader. And like, I know you have to take this as a requirement, but hey, bear with me. You're about to go into my mad scientist laboratory. I mean, what inspired this type of book? It's so groundbreaking as an academic book. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. um, it, inspired by my own experience teaching composition and not being able to find a textbook that I thought met the needs of the students that I was teaching. Um, mm -hmm. The other ones that I looked through tended to be big and dry and expensive um, yeah. and to cover, like to, to include lots and lots of, they, but they were intimidating basically. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think we have enough trouble with students coming in who are very nervous about their writing and to hand a student who is not comfortable with their own writing skills, a 500 page telephone book of a composition guide that and make them pay $120 for the privilege, I don't think serves anybody well. Yes. Um, so I wanted to do the opposite of that. <laughs> um, I wanted to do something that could lower the anxiety related to writing rather than heightening it and have a little fun with it. Um, so I pitched the writing assignments as experiments rather than mm -hmm. an essay, which strikes fear into the heart of most students. And, you know, an experiment is something you try out and you crash and burn and you tweak it and you try it again. Uh, I try to come up with some you know, funny prompts and, and funny examples and just to, to make something that's more entertaining, less intimidating, more fun. Yeah, well, and you do all of that. I love, like, Jeffrey has these moments where um, you'll even play around with, if you don't, if you think I'm serious right now with my joke, you can send $2,000 payable to Jeffrey Weinstock. Um, I mean, it's hilarious. And um, it kind of becomes a comedy, a comedy book meets memoir meets then the composition, which... Right is your own way of entering your own genre of how to um, develop rhetorical strategies. Like this is your way of writing. And I think to let your authenticity show in that way, I instantly wanted to take a course with this book because, um, you know, I had more, I mean, I really actually have to say I loved my composition. The courses were um, a blend of genres. Like I was taught, like a novel, short stories, poetry. I mean, I think sometimes it can go in that field or it can go in the more, I'm going to teach you all about logos, ethos, and pathos. And it can become more of a philosophical composition uh, course. But I like that you, um, you combine it all. And yeah, this metaphor of the mad scientist lab with writing, writing is an experiment. I keep saying to those like as I'm publishing work, like, you know, and I'm sure you get this with all the books you've written, Jeffrey, is how do you do it? Or um, how do these opportunities come? And I say, well, ask questions from your editors. Never be afraid to ask for their feedback, right? Never be afraid to, no, I need your critiques. Like I'll even say this to those I write I write for. I want your revisions. Like I, I want to know where I should go next because I am not the only writer here. This is a lab group, you know, to use your metaphor framing. It's a collaborative experience writing. And anyone who's published work, you know, there's a team behind them. This isn't just I wrote and that's it. <laughs> like, and I think for students, I think they can just see this one author's name, like say Stephen King. They'll just think, oh, Stephen King wrote this and then it came out. Like, no, <laughs> right? There's editors, there's the marketing team it's a development process. And yeah, it's what I loved about when I took chemistry courses. I loved my labs. That was one of my favorite parts is you get to make mistakes in science. You're supposed to make mistakes because you have to prove your hypothesis and it's probably not going to work out in your lab. 
uh, when you do it. Um, right. So to kind of bring that into the humanities is a really powerful metaphor. So, yeah, there is a connection between science and the humanities. There always has been. Um, so, no, thank you for doing that, Jeffrey. And yeah. How do you st students respond to this type of framing? I, it's been a positive response. I mean, and and in keeping with what you're saying, the first thing I tell them is no one naturally knows how to write a five page paper, a 10 page paper, a no. 20 page paper, a thesis, a dissertation. Um, no. These are things that one learns over time. Um, Right. No. Yeah. You don't. Uh, also, we are all the, the worst readers of our own work because we know what it is that we're trying right. to say. And it sounds good in our head. Sometimes it doesn't translate on the page. So we're reliant mm -hmm. upon other people to give yes. us feedback, to help us revise, to help us clarify um, revision as a strategy that I'm committed to as the best way for students to develop their skills. Um, yeah. So, and you yeah. have to license yourself to have a little bit of fun with it. <laughs> um, yeah. To yeah. not be the perfectionist for me, that's what I had to learn is, um, I was my own worst enemy. I think a lot of us are right in academic writing is we get in our way of thinking this has to be, or maybe early in your career. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, maybe there's still anxious writers who are, I think ang anxiety and writing go, can go hand in hand a lot, which is why I love your approach. Because when I'm even, when I, I'm working and was at the beginning of the dissertation, but where I am now is I'm having fun with it. Once I just said, hey, have fun with your argument. You're talking about phallic language with Whitman and I can't believe the things that are coming out, but it's all there backed up by the text that to just have fun and realize my committee will, they'll see where these, pathways can go if I haven't put in the theory or that's the committee's job to help me not that it has to all be tied in a box like no that's and I think though that's the anxiety is so many of us think the writing has to be tied in a box ready to be shipped off but once I let go of that it opened up my writing possibilities and you know and then the collaboration came, which was key to learn. So I appreciate, you know, that you're teaching students that at such a young time in their career, not even young with their age, but young in the studies and that it can come from your book, The Mad Scientist Guide, to just play around, see what happens with, you know, the drafts of your writing, because what's the worst that can happen? Okay, you have commas everywhere or, you know, you thought this could work with a body paragraph and you just, you know, start to dissect it like a monster's cadaver. <laughs> Isn't that the purpose, though, is to see what happens when you're moving things around? And yeah, it's, you know, do you see this in your own writing? Like, have you seen your approach to how you're teaching translate when you're writing? Like, do you think about this is what I tell my students and now I'm kind of have to take my own have to take my advice to my students for my own writing um i i have developed over time my own approach to approach to writing um i'm fairly disciplined in working out a outline before i get going mm -hmm. um, typically um every so often i'll start a piece without really having the end in sight but for the most part um i've already kind of worked out the pieces before i get going yeah. See, I'm the uh, over outliner or I used to be the over outliner where I would like bullet point every step in the writing. And then I realized, wait, I'm having fun with the journey. Right. It's good to have like it's good to have a frame of an outline, but you don't want to think you have to hit every step because yeah, it's not going to happen. I think that's um, right. And if you find yourself yeah. heading off in a direction, but it's productive then you see where it goes. Yeah, just like this conversation. <laughs> I mean, well, and then I saw you can start to dictate your, uh, um, like, I know you can dictate your voice for writing, but I've thought about that. And then I'm thinking, well, I'm not sure if it's going to translate to the page, but maybe I should play around with that. Hey, that's an experiment. Dictate my voice and see what happens. Um, 
But yeah, this has just been so wonderful. I mean, I feel like I could just keep talking to you, but I don't want to like hold you for the whole, um, <laughs> we're recording on a Saturday, everyone out there, but you know, breaking the fourth wall, but it's been such an exciting, uh, you know, um, conversation to have on a Saturday. So maybe to end Jeffrey, something that, um, you know, I want to have everyone out there maybe leave, um, this conversation with is just your own feelings, your unique feelings about, you know, you wrote the pop culture for beginners. You did the mad scientist guide to composition. They're all under $30, everyone. Also, uh, we have an ivory tower boiler room discount code in our show notes. So, you know, it's great. Um, you know, the price is going to even be discounted more. Um, so what I love is all the examples you use. You brought so many of them into the conversation here. I can hear from your, how you've been talking with me. Just, I'm like, wow, Jeffrey knows this, <laughs> you know, he knows that reference, this reference, uh, this Disney Gothic film I now need to look up. Uh, but, you know, what is it, what has intrigued you about, you know, is this where you, okay, let me frame it this way. I'm curious when you entered the profession of um, teaching in a college, you know, becoming an act, you know, becoming a faculty member, is this where you saw your writing going? Like, did you think that you would be doing more pedagogical? I mean, you have other writing, of course, of, you know, uh, theoretical analysis with Gothic texts, but did you think you'd be offering all these models of pop culture, how to teach composition? My career has definitely gone in some unexpected directions um, to a certain extent. Uh, the, the dissertation, my doctoral dissertation was on ghost stories by 19th century American women. Oh, wow. Um, so, and I was, that was a lot of archival work. And I was making the case that there was an unacknowledged tradition of essentially feminist writing on American women, by American women, in which the ghost in the house was a thinly veiled metaphor for the situation of women in American culture who weren't recognized, listened to, appreciated. Um, and there was this whole body of ghost stories. So that, that Gothic element has been a through line for me, but I came in as a 19th century Americanist. Um, and by sort of serendipity, I've ended up going more into uh, monsters and cult film, which for unexpected directions. Um, I got, this was 2007, I think. Um, I had published a, a short piece on Rocky Horror and got invited to do a book on the Rocky Horror Picture Show for, um, it wasn't, I was, um, now it's an imprint of Columbia University Press, but I got to do the Shortcuts book on Rocky Horror, which still is kind of my claim to fame because I get interviewed routinely around Halloween about Rocky Horror. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it's things kind of take, assume directions of their own that you could never have anticipated. And it's been uh, fun to kind of build a career around questionable subjects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. but And you let the... Um... And it seems like you let those doors, right? Once you open yourself to, okay, this isn't exactly the trajectory that I thought and like I thought scholarship would go. But once you surprise yourself, or that's how I felt, is I'm kind of just let these experiences continue to domino. Like, oh, okay. Like, oh, maybe there is something to now talking to real housewives experts or right that you start to surprise yourself of, Oh, there is a lot of um, ways this combines into my academic work. And I love that you, um, you know, are recognizing that for all of us, Jeffrey. I mean, it's a great model. Like you're now a model for me of how to do <laughs> writing. And um, I'm actually curious, do you have, I don't want to like, don't feel compelled, but do you have another 10 minutes? Yeah, I'm okay. Oh, okay. Just because we do have a um, Patreon, talk about another pop culture, <laughs> uh, new phenomenon, but we have subscribers. So I would love because, you know, it wasn't exactly coming up in the conversation, but now that I know 
about your Rocky Horror Picture Show fascination and other cult kinds of um, pop culture iconic moments. Um, I'd love to chat with you about that shortly and just, you know, pick your brain about your favorite uh, pop culture. Sure. Cult films, horror films. Uh, so everyone, we're going to end here in the uh, Ivory Tower Boiler Room and we're going to head to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Cafe, which <laughs> is only $5 a month for all our bonus episodes. So see you all there. And yeah. We're going to pick up with the Rocky Horror Picture Show because I have questions for Jeffrey. Okay. Bye, everyone, and see you over in the cafe. All right. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay. So we are figuratively back, <laughs> even though Jeffrey and I have never left the space um, in the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Cafe. But yes, yeah, so my first question is, did you see the Rocky Horror Picture Show first or... Did you see a production of the Rocky Horror Show oh, on have, stage? Yeah, no, I have this whole sort of backstory associated with Rocky Horror because the first time I saw it was in a friend's basement in high school on a VHS cassette. And wow. I mean, seeing the film in the theater with a whole group of people is one thing. Seeing it in a friend's basement with a bunch of drunk people when you can't hear anything that's being said on the TV and don't know what's going on is an entirely different experience. And I came away completely unimpressed with Rocky Har. And it yes. wasn't until I got to college um, and got spirited away by another group of people and actually saw you know, the real thing in Philadelphia um, um, when they were still doing it. I'm trying to remember which theater it was on Chestnut, I think, um, when they were still doing it every week with the stage performance and the shadow cast and everything. Um, that that's when I understood sort of what the Rocky Horror phenomenon actually was. Well, wow, every uh, did, week they were doing it. Wow. Yeah, I, I didn't actually see the stage performance until they had the Broadway version that had Joan Jett in it, whenever that was like 2000. Was this, the, this was the revival, right? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Alice so was, Ripley, I, don't I remember. think was in that. I, tried, uh, I think Brett, I'll have to look it up, but... Um, I'm pretty sure Rocky had like blonde hair, if I remember correctly. No, not in the one that I saw. No, I mean, he, def oh, okay. he definitely was cut from the Tim Curry mold. Um, yeah, and, I'll have to look. So what did you think of the Broadway production since you had kind of already been with the Rocky Horror Picture Show for so long? I, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And the the best part of it was that audience members did their best to try and crack up the cast members with the shout outs um and for the you know and, and of course the, the cast members were well versed in expecting these sorts of things but every so often someone had an original line from the audience that would catch the cast off guard and somebody would kind of crack up a little bit um, and it was really fun oh wow um i mean oh wait here i found it okay it was 2000 to 2002. Tom Hewitt. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking of Frankenfurter. Never mind. <laughs> See, I'm not as uh, well versed in the uh, uh, Rocky Horror universe. Oh, Daphne Rubin Vega from Rent. She was Magenta. Okay. Um, but yeah, Joan Jett was Columbia and the Usherette. Huh. Wow. Okay. Joan Jett. That's awesome. Um, I didn't know that she was in it. Um, Raul Esperanza, oh, I love Raul, was Riff Raff. Um, yeah, Alice Ripley was Janet. Okay. But wait, who was Rocky? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Hmm. It doesn't say. Oh, the net. Wait, Rocky's actually, who is Rocky? Is oh, there. Wait, there is no Rocky character. Oh, there is. Rocky Horror is the, the blonde, muscle-bound creation that Franken- The creation. Directs. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah, here, um, it just says that the narrator was like all these different stunt casting with celebrities. But, <laughs> okay. Jerry Springer, apparently. I don't know if you saw Jerry Springer as the narrator, but- Not in the, episode, not in the version I saw. I'm trying to think who it was. Um, if I heard the name, I would remember. Even that. Penn and Teller. Wow. They got some- <laughs> we got some big names for this. I think they should bring it back to Broadway again because it um I feel like it always does so well, right? With the cult following. But that is something is why what do you think it is about the Rocky Horror Picture Show that 
Is it the actual songs that's so fascinating? Is it the like high over the top camp? Is it relating to the audience, like directing to the audience, being in on the joke? Yeah, that they know they're spoofing science fiction films, horror films. Why is it this long lasting cult following? At this point, I think it's generational. Um, you know, at, at this point, I think you have a new generation of kids, college students who go because it's so well established. It's like this oxymoronic pop, uh, popular cult film. Um, people, it's almost a rite of passage, I think, for college students at this point that if you haven't seen it, you have to go see Rocky Horror. Why did it become the cult film that it is? Um, that, I think, is to a certain extent, serendipitous. I think it has to do with its repackaging as a midnight movie at the Waverly Theater in New York, the way that people began to do the shout outs and to bring props. Um, people would see it there and then take it back to their hometowns. Because it, it, when it was released as a feature film, it flopped. Mm. The only place it did well was in Los Angeles where they noticed people were seeing it multiple times. But then it got repackaged as a midnight movie in New York. And that's where the cult started to develop. And it blossomed from there. Um, the film itself has these spaces that invite the audience to participate with it. It's almost like these built-in pauses that license the audience to respond. There's that moment where Frankenfurter says, I see you quiver with Antissa. And he holds, right? And there's this like couple second hold where people can shout something out in the middle of his line. And I think you're right that also it has to do with a certain satisfaction in your command of the film that you can shout out a line that predicts what somebody's going to say. And it shows that you are well versed as a Rocky fan. So the whole bunch of things that go together to create it as a cult sensation. And at this point, it's a kind of rite of passage, I think. Yeah. Do you think that gothic horror genre lends itself more to cult following? Just because like from my own fascination... Um, I mean, there's a lot of sci-fi cult following and fantasy cult following. Do you think there's certain genres, sci-fi, fantasy, gothic, um, that it's the genre that kind of inspires the cult following? Or is it more of a narrative and just how it demands the audience to give their critical response? Like the audience needs to be participatory. Like maybe even why the housewives have such a cult following because you need to have your character. Like you need to have your best, best housewives, worst housewives. I mean, it's like a sports team, right? You have to have your, you have to have your draft pick in a way. I think initially it was generic, uh, a function of genre, in as much as fantasy, science fiction, and horror were held at arm's length by literary critics. So mm. people who embraced those genres were embracing a kind of outsider position um, to consciously kind of identify as a consumer of fantasy or science fiction or horror marked you as someone with tastes that ran contrary to the mainstream. Yeah. Um, so, and within those genres, if you have works that are kind of pushing the boundaries, even of the genre within horror, because they're exceptionally violent or gory or campy, those are the films that then become the kind of cult favorites because mm. they reward uh, the cult consumer as somebody who is knowledgeable and also able to appreciate the more extreme version of the genre. Um, yeah. I think at this point, while there, it may still hold a sort of transgressive edge, fantasy and science fiction and horror have been so thoroughly mainstreamed that I don't know that it retains that kind of cult cachet the way that it once did. You think about, you know, what are the really big shows that are streaming right now on Netflix or Amazon Prime, and they tend to be something like Stranger Things, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which is clearly science fiction horror, but also is thoroughly mainstream popular. Yeah, well, I don't, it seems like you might not have gotten caught into the White Lotus craze, but I was one of those White Lotus, um, HBO Max, another streaming service. <laughs> Another question I have is how many streaming services are we going to have? But <laughs> I just wish there was a package, Jeffrey. I wish there was something that I could buy as a bundle. Um, but then 
we wouldn't have all these companies, right? Uh, that's another question about monopolies. Um, but the White Lotus, it was one of those moments where it hasn't happened for a while. Desperate Housewives had a cool following. I loved that show. The telenovela, I mean, it there was a craze, right? Sometimes there's a show, The Sopranos, Boardwalk Empire, um, that the White Lotus kind of had that, where we're all wondering who's going to get murdered? Like, why is there a dead body? Um, because it had that murder mystery element, but it was also campy and comedic and um, scenic with Sicily. And you felt like you were, uh, you were um, sent over there and um, were part of the production, right? So maybe in a way that is, I wouldn't say it's a cult following yet, but it has the recipe for it. It has the elements of you being, you're, you have to buy into the story and you in a way are immersed there. So maybe it's the immersion that you have to be part of the group in a way. I don't know. I think, I yeah. think there's something to that, that there's a, an immersive quality to TV series that construct a world that people want to, to, to participate in and want to uh, absorb that leads to that kind of um, fandom, essentially. You know, the fandom, creates, yeah. It, yeah, it yeah. creates the fandom because there's a well-constructed world, interesting characters. It becomes uh, immersive for viewers who want to continue to participate with the show more. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it seems like um, you might not be in my real housewives universe but if you ever watch a real housewives episode let me know um because i love your take on the narratives um but you know it's been so wonderful chatting with you i feel like now i have like you know um so much to watch um also did you happen to see the haunting of hill house because i have a feeling you are a shirley jackson fan the the um, Mike Flanagan version on Netflix. Yes, I did. I did. Nine nine tenths excellent, one tenths wretched. Wow, that's interesting. The, the nine tenths. Okay, what do you mean by that? I need I mean, to know now. I mean, the first nine episodes I think are great, um, particularly episodes five and six. It hits its stride with the funeral, with those extended. Oh, the funeral. Shots which is just brilliant, right? Um, the last episode, it switches, it becomes all exposition, and then it is a fundamental betrayal of Shirley Jackson's, uh, whatever walks there, walks alone. They, he completely inverts that, they walk together, it becomes sort of feel-good family reunion thing. It yeah. is a betrayal. I, I have strong feelings about that final episode. No, I know. Well, the final episode, it kind of becomes like Hocus Pocus. Of, I don't know if you saw the second Hocus Pocus, but it's like, to me, that makes sense for Hocus Pocus. It's campy, it's family, adult, like it's trying to straddle. You need that feel good moment. But you're right. I have to say that The Haunting of Hill House has probably been the only television, in my opinion, the only television horror, gothic, psychological horror series that has made me question so much philosophically about death in a way that is both gut-wrenching and also um compassionate if that makes sense like it's the funeral scene the way that body the way that bodies are figured um i don't know i could see that in your skins course that the way like them in the funeral business and um I think even the the hauntings um, and how hallucinations happen, it was frightening. I mean, talk about, it outdid any kind of slasher film, in my opinion. I was, some of those episodes, I was freaked out. Like, <laughs> I right? It's like spine tingling. And you're right, it hits its stride. And then that last episode, just forget about the last episode, Jeffrey. Who cares? <laughs> Well, Nick uh, no. Flanagan, he has a tendency to do this, in my opinion. He kind of sabotages his own works when you get to the end. It was the same with Midnight Mass. I don't know if you saw that. That was another. No, but people have told me to watch it. Um, but it ends with like a 15-minute monologue. And, and um, hmm. 
there's I have some problems with it, but I like his stuff is really intriguing to me and interesting. And then it always kind of sabotages itself at the end. Mm, Mike Flanagan, we have some hot takes there. No, but <laughs> I, I understand what you're saying in terms of the genre, the exposition. Um, okay, well, so for my final question, what would you suggest since you are up to date with a lot of gothic film, TV? Um, or even authors, what should we watch? What should we read? You know, what's on your radar right now uh, that we haven't talked about that's like very contemporary? Oh, let's see. Um, I just finished watching Wednesday on Netflix, which is- oh, I need the, to watch that. Yeah, the updated sort of Adam's Family-ish, which I, I found it enjoyable. I have some issues. I don't want to spoil it for anybody with- the how it ended we um, could have you do the tiktok dance jeffrey <laughs> um lovecraft country if, if that was lovecraft an hbo series uh, adaptation of the book by the same name that mixes horror with social commentary in an interesting way and flips hp lovecraft's racism on its head Mm. Um, Lovecraft was kind of notorious for his racism, uh, even yeah. more than the kind of conventional racism of the 1930s. A lot of his horror is based on deep-seated anxieties about miscegenation. Mm. And the updated version of Lovecraft Country introduces racism itself as the monster uh, that's scarier than the other kinds of monsters. I thought that was very successful. I liked Lovecraft Country. Okay, good. So we have Wednesday, Lovecraft Country. Um, I feel like there's another Shirley Jackson in the works, but it could be. Yeah, I feel like there's always, there's always, I still think they should, well, the lottery would be tough because it's so short, but um, I do, um, no, 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 sorry, not Shirley Jackson. Our other favorite, Edgar Allan Poe. I'm sure you've heard this, but they're trying to get that Netflix series out about, um, I think it's on Netflix. Usher, right? Yeah, it's like Usher, and it's going to touch upon all these allusions to the stories, other yes. stories. This is Mike so, Flanagan's next one. He's done. Oh, it is a Mike Flanagan. Okay. Yes. Well, you know what? I like Mike Flanagan's taste. So thank you, Mike Flanagan, for bringing this out there. Um, someone has to do it. it. Yeah. His haunting of the House of Bly is Turn of the Screw, essentially. Yeah. Uh, let's just say I tried that one and I, uh, Turned it off. <laughs> I was, I was, I was very bored. Um, yeah, I kind of need some juice going on in the uh, some inertia and momentum. But well, there's my hot take. Um, watch the Haunting of Hill House, everyone. Um, but yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. This was so fun. I really appreciate your time. And yeah, I hope everyone out there, you know, they get your books and um, that they just. You know, look to you for all pop culture, horror, gothic, you know, uh, you're a tastemaker. So we need Jeffrey out there for the horror and gothic hot takes. Well, I hope to be in touch with you again, Jeffrey. It sounds good. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. Of course. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. You too. Okay. Bye, Jeffrey. Bye-bye.